One of the great things about being a member of the Columbia community are events like this, and also that I get to hang out with a lot of really smart people every day of the week. One of those people is Michael Doyle, although I don't see Michael as much as I would like. But I will say he's very typical of just so many talented uh, academics we have here at the university. Uh, Michael is a very distinguished and renowned scholar. He's got numerous books. He's quoted often. And he also holds a very distinctive title here at Columbia. He is a ranked university professor, which is not a very commonly achieved uh, rank here at the university. Um, I've also been on panels with him, and he is also one of the people with a, a very incisive thinking mind on hard problems. We did a panel together many, many years ago on Syria. And I was impressed with the way he brings his legal expertise to the table. As a result, you may or may not know, he teaches at the law school in the political science department and here at SEPA as well. So with that, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you as our moderator. Well, Peter, thank you so much for those kind comments. It's, it's a real honor for me to be here. It's a real treat. I've known Bob Jervis since I was a graduate student, but we have a strict rule here that we will not reminisce about Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd, I'd like to say that this panel is really something that would be important to him. It's also important to the world. Uh, it's important to him because he thought about these questions in, in big ways, and many of the issues we're going to be talking about draw from the scholarly corpus that he put together. But we're not going to be channeling Bob on this panel. Uh, we're going to be, in, be inspired by Bob to look at really hard questions and apply analytic thinking to them. And we really need to do so. We're entering an era, many think, of great power competition, and we have immense uncertainty attached to it. One of the more famous statements is by Henry Kissinger, who should know. He helped escalate and de-escalate the Cold War. He said that we're in the foothills of a new Cold War. What does that mean, in the foothills of a new Cold <laughs> War? We don't really know. But there is wide sense that we're in a period of increased rivalry among great powers. And there could also be episodes of hostility. And so we're examining those kinds of issues here. Uh, I'm doing so as an agent uh, called in relatively recently. I'm benefiting from uh, questions that were proposed by the colleagues uh, here uh, at the Saltzman Institute. And we're going to be ranging across questions such as the roles of misperception and images. You can certainly hear Bob in that on the foreign relations of the US, Russia, and China. We're going to be looking at the new geoeconomics of conflict and strategic trade, investment, and supply chains. And we're going to be looking at the effects of climate change in, and AI if we get to all of these things. So, <laughs> the way we're going to operate is after I give a very brief uh, introduction to these eminent panelists, is I will ask somebody to start out, and then from there, anyone can, can jump in uh, with additional comments on the question. And we're going to try to be brief so that we leave some time at the end to benefit from uh, your insights. Um, and so I'm delighted to uh, introduce this distinguished panel. Um, the thing that I would say about them all is that it's a striking combination of teacher scholars, uh, all of whom have put more than just their foot into the policy waters as debaters or, or actual practitioners. Tom Christensen, uh, you, we all know, he's a professor of public policy, uh, international affairs here at SEPA. He also direct, directs the New China program, very importantly. Uh, he is a former deputy assistant secretary of state, uh, handling issues of East Asia and the Pacific, with responsibilities for, Ch for, Ta for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia. I'm sure he spent equal effort on all of those three. <laughs> uh, and so we bring Im immense expertise uh, from him. He's just finished a book called Lost in the Cold War, a fascinating story of Jack Downey, who was America's longest held POW, and he has a prize-winning book, The China Challenge. Uh, next, uh, Jacob Liu. 
He's one of America's most distinguished uh, public servants. He's a member of the SEPA faculty who teaches here in economic policy and democratic institutions. Uh, he's better known, perhaps, as the 76th Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, President Obama's Chief of Staff, Deputy Secretary of State under Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, whom we'll be hearing from later this afternoon, and Director of the Office of Management and Budget under Presidents Obama and Clinton. And he currently chairs the board of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. My colleague, Kim Barton, Professor of Political Science here at, Barton, uh, at Barnard, uh, her publications uh, have ranged across a whole range of issues with regard to uh, the former Soviet Union, Russia, peacekeeping. But not only is her, has her active publishing schedule helped shape a debate in this area, she has taken her expertise to Washington repeatedly and taken on the burden of testifying before our wonderful representatives. Uh, there is an educational challenge for it that anyone <laughs> would be daunted by but that she has very well succeeded in. And she's written more than one prize-winning book. And to my immediate, uh, immediate right, Mira Rapp Hoopner. Hooper is the director for Indo-Pacific Strategy at the National Security Council, where she holds primary responsibility for the development and implementation of U.S. Indo-China Pacific Strategy and the management of the leader-level Quad Partnership. Uh, previous to that, she's been in a number of think tanks, and, and despite the fact that compared to, I would say, the rest of us on the panel, she's at the beginning of her career, she has already published two very influential books, one on the shield of the Republic on American alliances and the other with Rebecca Lisner on an open world. And I should say, she'll probably say it soon, she speaks in her personal capacity here. This is not an official statement from the NSC. So that's your distinguished panelist. We couldn't be more fortunate. Let's, let's jump right into the questions. And as I mentioned, these questions come collectively from the members here of Saltzman. I thought they were great questions, and so I simply borrowed them. Let's start, so to speak, with Bob Jervis. Uh, misperceptions, perceptions and conflict. Bob, as we all know, is big on misperception and psychological dysfunction as sources of error. So this is a purpose, perfect place to begin our panel. Uh, what are the main potential misperceptions today that might be affecting leadership in Moscow, Beijing, and Washington? Which of these misperceptions should we perhaps fear as triggers of inadvertent or miscalculated decisions of major war in coming years? Everyone's invited to jump in on this, but let's start with Mira, if you wouldn't mind. Mira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and I'll start by just saying thank you so much to our organizers uh, for a really terrific day. Um, I must admit that I had a little bit of apprehension uh, coming today because this is the first time um, that I'm back on campus since we lost Bob. Um, so I did feel a bit misty wondering what that would feel like. And I have felt on a number of occasions that he should be in the back of the room foraging for snacks uh, while we all <laughs> chat away. Um, but what I'm really struck by is just this extraordinary group of people and the wonderful conversation. So deeply grateful to Karen and Greta and Peter um, for having all of us. Uh, I will also reiterate that I am speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of the National Security Council. So when I read this question from, from Michael, uh, my mind flashed immediately to a worksheet that Bob handed out in his first uh, session of IR1 every year when he taught it uh, for graduate students. And it was a worksheet that listed every psychological bias that he thought was potentially relevant. <clears throat> to international relations. And I believe there were approximately 75 <laughs> on one side of the worksheet. And one of our assignments after the first class was to go home and study them and think of examples of these psychological biases. And I say this just to signpost the fact that there are obviously innumerable psychological bias, biases that are, are prevalent in international politics. And part of what Bob did in his work is teach us that these aren't aberrant, they're not abnormal behaviors. These are things that afflict every single human being who is making decisions. And the point is not to defeat or overcome them. The point is to understand and maybe mitigate them. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, I'll point to just one set of biases that worries me in particular when I think about the risk of miscalculation. 
Um, and I'll point in particular to a fact that was pointed to on our first panel and that I think um, Kim and Tom are, are well positioned to expound upon if they choose. And that is the fact that in both Moscow and Beijing, we have relatively insular decision-making environments where small groups of advisors are advising a incredibly strong leader. And this is not necessarily a feature of all autocracies, but I think Bob would agree, despite the fact that his work was not primarily focused on regime type, that leadership decision-making structures that are structured such as these are very dangerous because they are kind of breeding grounds for psychological biases. Just two that pop to mind when I think about it, Number one, of course, groupthink. When you have uh, a number of advisors who are interested in potentially their own preservation um, and how to please a leader who has a very clear worldview, the likelihood that all will converge on a palatable decision as opposed to the right decision skyrockets. Um, number two, confirmation bias. Uh, the idea that a leader who himself or those around him may have a very fixed worldview tends to interpret new evidence as confirmatory as opposed to disconfirmatory of the chosen pathway forward. Um, these are just two that I've thought about a lot recently um, and that I think Bob would have a lot more to tell us about if we were here. Um, and I think, again, the, the risk of miscalculation uh, is, is greatly exacerbated by both of these two, but in general, this sort of tightened circle of decision making um, that we see in both capitals. Uh, but something else that I have noticed uh, during my time in government is a bias or a set of tendencies um, that definitely does not just afflict Moscow and Beijing and definitely afflicts the United States of America as well. And it's one that Bob would point to a lot in conversation. I'm not sure that it has a label, um, and if it does, I've forgotten it. But that is the fact that I think um, many powers tend to see their challengers as monolithic actors who are incredibly strategic and purposeful in their actions, whereas they are likely to overdiagnose and potentially even self-handicap themselves when it comes to bureaucratic dysfunction or multiple sets of signals that may be sent by different actors. Um, so something that I think about a lot is the fact that we should assume that challengers, no matter how they're structured, probably have more dysfunction behind the scenes than we are able to see. And we should also assume that we as actors are being seen by those challengers as more purposeful than we may intend to be. Great. Thank you for that insight. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to follow up with, with Mira's suggestion and then ask the two of you at the end maybe to comment a little bit on Moscow and Beijing, what particular misperceptions right. that we might be experiencing at the present time. Right. Kim, would you want to go next? Sure. I think Mira is absolutely right to talk about the personalistic authoritarianism of Putin, which Scott Sagan mentioned earlier also. And I think we had um, a very good example of this when we saw the February 21st meeting that Putin publicized, where he insisted that all of his Security Council members agree with him about the necessity of saying that the uh, areas in the Donbass uh, should be given independence. And there was some some uh, uh, confusion or potential pushback from some of his advisors. And when he saw that, he immediately went in for the kill and said, you must agree with me. Don't you agree with me? Um, and made it very clear where the power balance was. And I think in Putin's case in particular, everything was aggravated by the COVID crisis because we know that for um, at least a year and probably longer, he was extraordinarily isolated and uh, forced people to go through quarantine before they would see him. Um, and so it wasn't even a matter of a small group making decisions. It was Putin and an occasional person from outside who shared his background, all people who came from the KGB or the FSB, um, who had known him for many years. So it's not even people who were in any kind of a bureaucratic uh, pre-existing arrangement uh, who were furthering his ideas. And uh, I would just add a couple of things to what, what Mira has said in terms of things that were psychological problems that I think were aggravated. The first is that I think, and we haven't really talked very much about Putin as an individual, Putin really has had for quite some time a personal desire to go down in history as the man who made Russia great again and has thought about it in territorial terms and has thought about, thought about it as if there is a single Russian entity that Ukraine is a part of. And I think that that meant that he believed that he was uniquely positioned to do this and would not tolerate anybody who said that there were any difficulties associated with it. 
Now, we have no way of knowing whether his intelligence agents on the ground in Ukraine actually gave him any countering information to that. Um, but it does appear that the information that he had was that Ukraine did not have any national identity, um, that Ukraine was waiting for Russia to take an action so that it would rid them of uh, whatever the, uh, the threat was that was in domestic politics in Ukraine. Um, and he was very surprised that his first uh, actions did not work. Um, and I think the, the second thing that uh, we might think about um, is prospect theory, which was mentioned in the first panel as well. And that helps explain why Putin is insisting on doubling down, even though what we've seen is that everything that Russia has tried so far has had very limited success, if any at all. Um, but that he's very concerned in, in the loss realm of things, that he sees things in terms of losses at this point instead of gains and cannot tolerate any losses um, because to lose would be to take away what he believes is the rightful path that he is on. Um, and, and he really sees reestablishing Russian control over Ukraine as being something that rights a historical wrong. Um, and as he said uh, in a speech where he talked about what he did in Crimea in 2014, uh, that Crimea was primordial Russian land and that he was just restoring something that had been there for all time that everybody should recognize. Um, and I think when we put these things together, I would disagree with some of the realist uh, arguments that we heard on the first panel, uh, because I think this combination of believing by Putin that he has this place in history and of being unwilling to tolerate losses means that he will not give in if there is negotiation, that he will use the period of negotiation to reestablish his forces as best as possible and to fight again. And I'm afraid that that puts us in a terrible, terrible situation because there really is no answer um, to the question of the spiral versus deterrence model. There is no good answer as long as Putin remains in power. Um, and as of yet, it doesn't seem that there's any mechanism for um, having him lean, leave power. So I think we're in a very dangerous situation, but I don't think negotiation is the answer. Well, thank you. Tom. Oh, thanks a lot, Michael. And thanks to the organizers for having me. It's a great honor. I was a student of Bob Jervis among a couple of other great professors here like Jack Snyder and Andy Nathan's in the room as well. So it's a great honor to speak here today. And I spent most of my career worrying about the rise of China. So I want to preface my comments with that, that um, I'm concerned. I'm concerned for a, a range of reasons about the rise of China, the security implications, et cetera. But I want to talk about a couple of uh, misperceptions that I see in that US-China strategic competition. And one is in Washington, and that's the notion that China has an alternative blueprint for the international order that it wants to use to replace the US-led international order that was created after World War II. Um, I think it's a very consequential misperception. It's extremely widely held across the two parties, um, and I see almost no evidence for it. Um, so I think that that's my misperception on the American side. On the Chinese side, I think it's a victim mentality, a kind of post-colonial nationalism. Even though China was never really colonized, uh, it has a post-colonial uh, nationalist view. And I think that what, how this plays out in a consequential way that I see on a regular basis talking to Chinese elites in track twos, which you can still do, is this notion that when China's neighbors in particular uh, stand up to China, balance against China, whatever verb you want to use for it, that this has to be some kind of American plot, that the United States is behind the scenes manipulating the situation so as to keep China down, and China is the victim. And what Chinese elites have a real hard time seeing is that their own assertive, sometimes aggressive behavior is what's leading these states to change their policies toward China. It's not the United States. Government. Now, I'm giving Mira a great deal of credit, because I think the I think the Biden administration has done a great job of rallying allies, of building strength uh, that was harmed, I think, during the Trump administration, the U.S. alliance and partner system in East Asia. And I think they've done a great job. And, and, and Myra in, Myra in particular, working on the Quad, I give her great credit for this. So the Biden administration deserves some credit. But nobody brings countries together like China itself. And China has behaved so obnoxiously towards its neighbors that um, that's a big part of the story. And I think it would be better for everyone if Chinese elites recognized that and adjusted their behavior accordingly, um, that they have uh, helped cause Japan to d double the defense budget, or commit to double the defense budget. They've helped cause countries like the Philippines to get closer to the United States in ways that the United States wanted. And those countries have agency. Hmm. And uh, they're reacting to real stimuli that are coming out of Beijing, not necessarily out of Washington. Well. 
Thank you very much. I'd like to take us a, a slight step and stay at the level of perceptions, but move to the role of analogies. Uh, in, during the Cold War, the Munich analogy was said to have a great deal of influence, uh, pushing states to be more confrontational, to avoid another appeasement. Some have suggested that there's a, a Vietnam analogy, that is the dangers of entanglement, uh, I think less, less influential. But nonetheless, those analogies played a role. And I guess the question that I'd pose to you, and this is getting much more speculative, are, are we about to establish or create a Ukraine uh, analogy? Because uh, this is a moment of great crisis under which perceptions shift and change. Uh, and if so, what? That is, is the Ukraine analogy going to be, you know, a, a failure of deterrence? As I think it was, I think uh, Mr. Zelensky said that at last year's opening uh, speech at the Munich conference. And uh, some of our political leaders, including one who's just now running for president, has said similar things. This is a deterrence failure. Uh, we uh, will define Ukraine in the future. Alternatively, there may be another Ukraine analogy out there, is that this is a, a triumph of coalition self-defense of a sort uh, you know, rarely seen in international history. And you know, how many small little remote countries, you know, go back and think of Manchuria, think of Ethiopia, were able to mobilize this degree of international support the way Ukraine is. So uh, any speculation on is there any possibility of a Ukraine analogy, and more pertinently, what might it be that we would draw out of this? Some, some of you might reasonably say to me, too soon, <laughs> and that would be a reasonable response. <laughs> Let me start with Kim and, and take it from there. Sure. Um, Michael, I think it is too soon. I think it, the analogy that gets drawn from it is going to depend on whether Russia actually achieves any of the aims um, that it seems to have in the war. Um, but before we start talking about analogies, I would just remind us all that Bob thought of analogies as being one of those psychological tools that gets in the way of good decision making mm -hmm. um, because it causes causes people to look at generalities that don't necessarily apply to the specifics and the complexity of the case at hand. Um, so I would caution us all about using analogies and, and instead perhaps uh, uh, thinking about lessons rather than analogies uh, for maybe the immediate future. But I think Michael's absolutely right that one of the lessons that we've learned from this, that uh, statements about the demise of U.S. leadership and the demise of NATO as an institution were premature. Um, Mira, I'm sure, can speak a, a lot more about this mm -hmm. because of her excellent book on that, on that subject. But NATO has proven to be an incredibly flexible uh, alliance and institution um, in ways that I don't think anybody would necessarily have predicted. And it goes beyond NATO to think about the cohesion that we've had in international sanctions, uh, even among countries who uh, seem to be economically harmed by those sanctions, um, such as many of the countries in Europe that have been harmed by their pushback uh, against uh, Russian energy dominance uh, in, their, in their country. So I think that is a major lesson. Um, I think another major lesson that we have to remember is that there were a few years ago people saying that war between nation state actors was no longer going to happen, um, that all we had to worry about was civil war and that nation states would never go to war with each other again because you could never imagine gaining anything from taking over somebody else's territory. Putin, I mean, I don't know what he's thinking about gaining from taking over Ukrainian territory that he's meanwhile destroyed. He didn't get much out of taking over Crimean territory, but nonetheless, he acted. And so I think another lesson that we have to keep in mind is that the history of uh, state intervention inside other states militarily uh, may still matter quite a big, uh, quite a big amount. Um, and the third lesson is, is premature, um, and we certainly spent a lot of time talking about this in the, in the first panel as well. Um, but I think many people were afraid that there would be a sooner escalation, not merely to nuclear use uh, by the Russian side, um, but that there would be um, some sort of escalation when it came to cyber tools. And uh, we've certainly seen Russia use cyber uh, tools in the conflict, um, but we have not yet seen, at least uh, knock on wood, uh, if there is any wood around here, um, not yet the kinds of things that people were afraid might happen in terms of an attack on, for example, American infrastructure. And it makes me think that um, part of the reason behind it is that cyber is not all that different from nuclear in some ways, even though people like um, uh, uh, Jay have been talking about all the differences between uh, cyber weapons and nuclear weapons, in that there is sort of this mutual assured destruction uh, problem that the use of cyber weapons entails. 
Um, and so even if this, this change is in the future and we see escalation, the escalation was slow to come. Um, and I think that that's an important lesson. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone want to add to this? Other, yes, Mira, go yeah. and then Tom. I, I'd love to just jump in on this one. I, I overwhelmingly agree with um, everything that Kim said with one exception, uh -oh. which is <laughs> the idea that it is too soon to start drawing analogies. I definitely think the sort of realm of the analogy is not complete and they will continue to be drawn, but I actually think that at least in the Indo-Pacific, we already see a wide range of countries drawing analogies from the war in Ukraine, extrapolating to what could happen in Asia. Um, and I think that's actually been pretty explicit um, in some foreign policies. The ally I'm thinking about first and foremost is Japan, where just over a year ago, Prime Minister Kishida made actually a, a rather unprecedented decision to break quickly with Russia, with whom Japan had long uh, courted a rapprochement over a territorial dispute over some islands dating back to World War II, to stand strongly with the United States and like-minded partners and to oppose Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This was directly extremely costly for Japan and in, in particular not necessarily a popular decision within Kishida's own party because it essentially backburnered the possibility of ever solving this territorial dispute. And in the year since then, you've seen the same prime minister make historic decisions, double, more than doubling Japan's defense budget, coming up with a new national security strategy, and making major and rather radical force posture moves with the United States when it comes to Japan's own defense. Uh, when he visited Europe just a few weeks ago, Kishida was actually quite explicit in saying that Ukraine today may be the Indo-Pacific tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think we should actually see this set of decisions made over the course of the year, not as in any way distinct, but rather a rather bold set of decisions being made by a leader who now sees not just North Korea, not just China as the competitors on his borders, but what willingly accepted a more competitive relationship with a very dangerous Russia, not just because he saw a major assault on the international order or on Ukraine specifically, but because he feared for what that might mean for Asia down the road. Tom, could I <laughs> press you in, in a little bit on this question? There's some in the press that have been talking that uh, the Chinese should learn from Putin's experience in Ukraine that Taiwan is a much tougher target than it might be, not just for what's inside Taiwan, but for the way an international coalition <laughs> might mobilize to support it. And I was wondering, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I was wondering whether you had any reaction <laughs> to that issue. Yeah, you can put me on the spot. So, so I just think that Ukraine has positive les lessons from an American perspective vis-a-vis -vis China uh, and potentially some negative ones. And mm -hmm. the positive ones are that what already looked like a very difficult operation, which would be an invasion of Taiwan, right, must look even riskier and more dangerous for the Chinese leadership, in part because uh, the Chinese military leadership had looked up to the Russian army in particular uh, for a long time as a very effective force, and they've done so poorly. And I think in part because of the civil military uh, aspect that Cynthia Roberts raised before, which is, which is can the civilian leadership trust the advice and, uh, and, and planning of their military leadership. Can they be trusted to say what will actually happen once uh, the, the order is made? So I think that's a positive thing for deterrence from a US and from a Taiwan perspective. A second thing is I think the Biden administration has done a great job of putting together a multilateral economic coalition to punish Russia. And I think the Chinese leadership is almost certainly surprised at how coherent that coalition has been and some countries like Germany are paying quite a high cost uh, to stay in that coalition, and they have. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another uh, aspect of deterrence. In a conflict other than, say, an invasion of Taiwan, a uh, much easier military operation for the mainland and a much harder one for us and for Taiwan to counter would be a blockade. Mm -hmm. But uh, if Beijing were to launch a blockade on a clear blue day, now they have to worry not only about the length of that blockade and the economic disturbance that will be caused by that military operation alone to the entire regional economy, mm -hmm. but also the potential that the United States would be able to rally multiple countries to pu punish China over the long run. In, a, in what we'll talk about later, I understand, uh, a, a, a very uh, globalized, interdependent economy with transnational production chains. So that's a positive force. But there's one really negative analogy, and it scares me, and it's about the United States. Mm -hmm. 
And that is a very simple analogy that and you hear it in the Congress, uh, you sometimes hear it in, uh, in other places, and it's this analogy that says, the problem with Ukraine was that we didn't ally with Ukraine before the war and deter the war. Mm -hmm. So now what we should do is throw out our traditional one China policy, mm -hmm. throw out strategic ambiguity and form a formal alliance of sorts, either in name or in spirit mm -hmm. with Taiwan to prevent a war with Beijing. And I can return to this in your later questions, but uh, my basic uh, theory of strategy and uh, comes uh, largely out of being a Bob Jervis student is you can't deter a war by causing one. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the restoration of the U.S. ROC alliance, which was a prerequisite for normalization of relations between the United States and the PRC, if that is restored, the likelihood of war goes way up, right. not way down. Mm -hmm. And I think people are drawing that lesson from Ukraine. It's a dangerous lesson. And I wish they would uh, put that one away. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Jack. J just to follow up on what Tom was saying, um, I think that uh, in Ukraine what we're seeing is a pretty substantial misperception on Russia's part um, because it looked at 2014 and took the wrong lesson from mm -hmm. 2014. It saw what the response to what it did in 2014 mm -hmm. as meaning that they could do whatever they want in 2022. And it turned out that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. It turned out that when they came in with the massive force that they did, our European allies were prepared to do more than they would have been prepared to do in 2014. I think the Chinese have been watching this since 2014. I think they made the judgment after 2014 that they needed optionality in terms of how their economy would work should they be subject at some point to sanctions from the U.S. I think after what we've done very effectively in Russia, that's ratcheted up. Um, and I agree with what Tom just said, that the burden is in part on us to message to the Chinese not to get the wrong lesson from that. Thank you. Speaking of trade, let's move now to uh, geoeconomics globalization. We've seen uh, the reemergence of global rivalry, spirits of global conflict, despite globalization. So the old fashioned view that went back to the 19th century that trade would produce peace uh, is once again, for the fourth, fifth, sixth time, being refuted in some degree, given these tensions. But it would really be uh, unfortunate if we didn't drill down a bit, bit deeper into what might be special about the geoeconomics of our own time. And so the question is, we see uh, big disruptions in supply chains that are taking place in the context of this particular set of rivalries coming out of a course out of uh, Russia, Ukraine, but with potential knock-on effects in East Asia too. And so what should we be doing to, let's call it rethink, you know, the trade makes peace thesis to make it more strategically insightful and useful in thinking about globalization today? And I think I'll start out with, uh, with Tom and then, and then ask Jack to jump in too, especially. So I, I would urge you not to rethink the thesis. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot more peace than there is war. Um, there is some war. Unfortunately, there's some war. It's a lot more peace than there is war. I think that global, globalization and the creation of a transnational production chain has created a type of interdependence we've never seen before. A lot of people talk about World War I and trade interdependence, and you still had World War I. OK, fine. But trade interdependence before World War I was very different than the kind of interdependence we have now. I know Helen Milner's in the back of the room there, and uh, she taught me about this very early in my career, about the different type of interdependence that we're seeing now mm -hmm. from what we saw in the past. And I think it's been a major force for peace. It's very hard to, to demonstrate because it's a counterfactual. But if you look at East Asia, you have a region in which there hasn't been a major interstate war since 1979. Mm -hmm. That is a miracle by any historical standard. It is incredible mm -hmm. that you've had no interstate war in that region. And for some reason, on both sides of the island in, in Washington, our policies in East Asia are considered a failure. And they need to be fundamentally rethought. Mm -hmm. Right? They've been an incredible success. And one of the reasons they've been a success is the United States, after the Cold War, maintained a very strong military presence in East Asia. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of the story. And I support that. And that needs to continue. But a second part of the story is the United States and other actors in the region supported this deepening transnational production chain, this deepening interdependence. And how else can you explain why countries like China, Japan, South Korea, countries with unsettled historical disputes, very different political systems, 
structural change with the rise of China, um, and outstanding sovereignty disputes, outstanding so have not fought mm -hmm. over those disputes, including in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And I think that the transnational production chain is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, and I'll criticize both the United States and China on this score, unfortunately, trade is no longer popular in the United States. Mm -hmm. Free trade, multilateral agreements for free trade in particular, not popular in the United States. Everybody wants to protect and everybody wants to have industrial policy instead of what we used to support. We used to be the champions of this, uh, this order. Um, and things that were, I would say, a big contributor to the outcome that I'm describing, like China joining the WTO in 2001, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a good idea. It wasn't an American idea, but it was a good idea, uh, have been attacked on both sides of the aisle in a way that has implications not only for the United States economy and the world economy moving forward, but for international security. On the Chinese side, I think the lessons of Ukraine will accelerate a process that really started in about 2006 and really took off after the, first, after the financial crisis of 2008. And that was that China should replace as many elements of that transnational production chain with Chinese production as they could. Um, and China values economic growth so much that they haven't gotten very far in the process of doing that uh, because they don't want to sacrifice economic growth for the replacement. But the spirit behind that could be very damaging to the international economy and very damaging to that factor for peace in East Asia if it were to move forward. And if both of the United States and China move in that direction, China to become more self-sufficient, the United States to decouple, um, I think it could have really bad implications for uh, issues of war and peace in East Asia and around the world. Hmm. I'm gonna turn to Jack in a moment, but just to tee it up to say that, you know, a number of countries are drawing uh, the lesson out of the Ukraine war that the Europeans became vastly too dependent upon Russian energy, the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline phenomena. And the message that's coming out is never again. We should never become that dependent on a potential uh, situation where there's a war, there's a rival, there's a new campaign of aggression. And so there's a lot of talk in the American business circles and in public policy circles about home shoring our investments or friend shoring our investments, meaning shifting to NATO-related allies. And uh, the question I'd pose, pose to Jack is, you know, what do you, what do you make of this new mantra, and what sort of cost might it have on the prosperity of the globalized economy that we've been experiencing for a considerable time now? As in so many uh, of these difficult questions, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of decoupling the global economy entirely after the last 50 years is not a practical one. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of where on that spectrum you end up falling, what priorities you're advancing mm -hmm. in making decisions about where you decouple or where you friendshore. Um, and what the implications are in terms of economic and geopolitical stability. Um, yeah, I think it's important to go back to kind of first principles of economic diplomacy. If you were completely decoupled, you would have very little positive or negative leverage to bring to bear. You couldn't open your markets and win friends by offering economic growth. You wouldn't have the ability to put sanctions in place, to hurt an economy, to use non-military means to achieve your policy objective. Um, I think the risk with economic nationalism being so strong is we end up going farther down the path than we really should, and we end up with less economic and strategic leverage in the world. Um, you know, while it's not a market issue, foreign assistance fits into this mix because the idea of kind of pulling apart is also don't give so much money away. We saw in the Solomon Islands just in the last months, you know, what, we're a historic, not major power, but a strategic ally we were the crucible of fighting in World War II was, kind of drifted off of our radar over more than a decade. Mm. And Russia, mo uh, China moved in with relatively modest economic support and 
may not be a good partner, but they were a partner. You know, Mira and I worked on doing some things on the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. Something beats nothing. Mm -hmm. We have to be out there engaged in order to be a better alternative. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea of friendshoring for uh, resilience, mm -hmm. for uh, making yourself less subject to uh, others hurting you, is one that makes a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be careful that we don't treat our friends the way we treat our foes. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, while there are a lot of very good reasons for the decisions that were made in the CHIPS Act, mm -hmm. there are some very good friends of ours who are asking, are we reliable friends if we treat them as adversaries when it comes to mm -hmm. issues like technology? So I think we have to make these decisions. Now, getting to the core point that, that Tom was mentioning, and I think it, it's very related, there is no question that there's a move towards economic nationalism here and in a lot of parts of the world. Mm -hmm. It's for someone who believes in the benefits of globalization as Tom does, partially our own fault that as a domestic policy matter, we have not distributed the benefits mm -hmm. of global growth that came from globalization mm -hmm. in a way where people th think it was on the level and fair. Now, that's a domestic challenge that ties directly into our ability to remain integrated on the global stage. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't know where the right balance is. Mm -hmm. If it takes a CHIPS Act that offends you know, Korea, South Korea and Japan to win back the confidence of Americans that we should be engaged in the world, it might be that in the long run that gives us strategic advantage mm -hmm. to re-engage. If it becomes a slide into mm -hmm. buy America means just America, means we don't have strategic allies that we trust and will be, remain connected to, I worry deeply about it. And with our adversaries, I think, or competitors, we have to be very careful about sending the signals that you're better off going it alone. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, we could lose the preeminent power that comes from the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we take that for granted. We'll talk a little more, I think, about that later. Yeah. No, I, I think that point's very, very powerful. Just to add an observation, you know, what the, one of the temptations of, of economic nationalism is that we have you know, endogenous politicians and the, the benefits that can be distributed by an economic nationalist strategy are sometimes substantial, whether it might be you know, trade and tariff protection or investment uh, incentives. And the costs are long-term and born usually more generally. And so there is a, a temptation to go in that route from a purely domestic political point, uh, in, even in uh, you know, institutionalized democracies like our own. And there's probably something equivalent in terms of uh, of satisfying military bureaucracies if we turn to countries for whom those are the key uh, actors in policy making. We'll probably come back to this, but at this moment, let's, let's move gears more substantially to questions about you know, climate change, okay. uh, a, a really other really big issue, and whether we fail to or succeed in mitigating and addressing the climate change uh, it is such a huge part of the world economy that it's likely to have knock-on effects on politics and, and geostrategy. And so let's explore both. Let's assume that we make zero progress, you know, business as usual scenarios with regard to uh, climate change. How might this affect, you know, great power competition? either directly or indirectly. Assume that we go charging, blasting right through you know, these three and a half or four degrees centigrade, what should we expect if we look over the horizon for great power politics in the future? Kim, would you want to start us out on that? Sure. Uh, thanks. So I've been teaching a class on the global politics of climate change, and my own research is moving in that direction as well. Um, and certainly the current great powers have been very badly affected by climate change already. And we can expect that it will be something that will actually uh, lead to a lessening of some of their advantages. So, for example, Vladimir Putin seems very centered on developing the northern sea route, the uh, coast of Russia on the Arctic. 
uh, without recognizing that permafrost melt uh, is going to be having a, a huge effect on the stability of the coastline, um, and that that may mean that he has difficulty attracting foreign powers to use that for anything. Uh, he was very uh, enthusiastic when the ship got caught in the Suez Canal, saying that here, you know, we have the northern sea route as an alternative. Um, but we've also seen that China has not been very willing to uh, uh, publicly uh, go against sanctions guidelines, and so China has not been using the Northern Sea Route as much as it, uh, uh, as much as Russia would have wanted it to happen. Um, I think also we see um, some of the difficulties. We were just talking over lunch about um, ports that the United States might have that would be affected by climate change and flooding. Um, certainly, China has already been affected by flooding and uh, by, by other problems associated with climate change. So we're seeing severe weather effects. We're seeing flooding. We're seeing fires. We're seeing permafrost uh, uh, issues. So the, the great powers will all be uh, affected by them. But I think we need to keep in mind that, by definition, great powers are those that have more resources. And what we're going to see going forward is that the states that have more resources are going to be able to better adapt to climate change than the poorer countries in the world are able to adapt. Um, and it's going to be the countries that are, uh, have the least resources that are going to be facing the most misery as time goes forward. Um, something else to keep in mind, though, is that countries nearest the equator are likely to be affected the worst. And so that means that China, and especially India, uh, may have the, the worst effects of climate change in comparison to the United States and Russia, uh, which are, are benefited by their more northern geography. So I think there's all kinds of complexities to bring to bear, but I just want to point out right now a way that great power uh, competition is negatively affecting uh, climate change. Um, and one that um, uh, has not made it much into the news, but that is near and dear to my own heart, which is that before Putin decided to invade Ukraine, there were a number of Russian enterprises controlled by oligarchs who were actually becoming more friendly to climate-related and environmentally-related questions because they wished to have investment with European partners. And the European Union has been the biggest leader probably in the world in terms of putting up um, constraints on actors to try to force them into being more climate friendly. Uh, for example, the CBAM, the border mechanism that says that you have to have a tax in your home country that is equivalent to the tax that e Europe is placing on uh, climate uh, negative uh, actions or else we will uh, take out that kind of a tariff on you. And Russian oligarchs were responding to that. And then, of course, sanctions came into being, which means that the possibility for having significant relationships with Europe are very curtailed anyway. Um, and so that means that Europe's influence is being decreased by the fact of sanctions. So sort of an unintended side effect of sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, but just there are so many things we could talk about, but that's just a start. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jack, why don't, we, why don't we flip it around and, and assume that through some magic, we all become absolutely dedicated uh, climate mitigators and adopt the strongest possible strategies and actually succeed in reducing uh, you know, carbon emissions by reducing or changing the technologies or the production of those industries that produce this the most. What sort of a world might that begin to lead us toward, do you think? Well, I wish um, that it was a likely scenario, right. um, but I, I think we're more likely to move more slowly. Um, I think that in a world where we have a, a, a prayer of a chance of hitting carbon uh, targets, mm -hmm. we're going to be depending on technologies and materials that are different mm -hmm. um, and that are not uh, equally present in all parts of the world mm -hmm. and where the extraction and processing of them mm -hmm. has serious consequences in terms of other environmental concerns. And we have a, a competitor that's been very aggressive attaching those resources and controlling them. I think we need to think about a world where there is real access to rare earths, uh, where the technology that is developed uh, can be uh, manufactured without dependence on one or two other countries. Um, and I don't think we're having that debate in a way where we deal straightforwardly with the trade-offs. Mm. Um, you know, for example, there are huge amounts of rare earths in parts of the United States. They tend not to be as high quality. They tend to be more marbled and mm. less easy to extract. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of water to get at them. I don't hear a lot of debate about what are we doing to develop the technology to do that in a clean way. So in a world where batteries and renewable energy are really as prevalent as we need them to be, mm -hmm. we can be 
part of that in a great power way, not just a dependent party uh, on others. Um, I think the, 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 you know, there are a lot of countries in the world that are emerging economies that have an awful lot of those assets. Mm -hmm. And having relations with those countries where we're the friendly country that they want to do business with gets back to economic relations, mm -hmm. having those ties. On technology, and I give a lot of credit to the administration on this, working with our allies in a concerted way, uh, there, it is impossible as one country to control all of the technology that you need. Um, we need to have the openness with our friends and allies so that collectively we are in a position to be at the cutting edge and if necessary limit access um, and not have others limit access. In a way, we saw in telecommunications the opposite of that happen. You know, we saw the West kind of not work together developing an alternative to Chinese technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think in renewable uh, energy technologies, we need to affirmatively look at it as how do we have a global alliance to drive this forward. Mm -hmm. And that means the materials, the technologies, and the relationships. Mm -hmm. Can Thank I you. Sure. About economic strategy, because you, you'd raised before this idea of creating more independence as a, a driving force in American uh, strategy as it relates to economic policy. And I think that, of course, the United States needs to have ready access to various types of materials and products, right, mm -hmm. for, from, from a national security perspective. But I would say that in more, more cases than not, the solution to that is to diversify the supply not to have it be made in America. That if we have enough friendly countries that make these products, we will have ready access. We have a very strong Navy, so no one's gonna blockade the United States. Um, and uh, that's probably a better way to maintain these relations that Jack is talking about. Mm -hmm. And the second piece of economic policy on security, which has gotten a lot of attention recently, is restricting things that we sell to our potential adversaries like China. Mm -hmm. And it's treated as if it's entirely new, and it's not new. So. For a very long time, we didn't sell uh, technologies to China that would uh, help accelerate military modernization in China. So that's not a new thing. When I was in the government, there were 30 plus technologies that we wouldn't sell. And now, of course, there's been technological change since I left the government in 2008. And there are new products that are con considered very concerning, like uh, very high level uh, semiconductors that are useful for artificial intelligence. That's going to be important for the next generation of weapons. That's fine. But what worries me is we always had back then, and we should have now, this idea of high fences around small yards, that there are certain products you don't want to sell mm -hmm. to China uh, because they're directly related to the military. But you don't want to decouple the entire economy, and you don't want to try to do harm to China's basic economic growth in the process. And what worries me about the economic nationalism that Jack has raised a few times is this becomes a great opportunity and occasion for protectionists, for, for, for economic nationalists, and for uh, industrial planners, you know, these are industrial policy planners, to say, we shouldn't sell any of this stuff to China. We should try to keep them from, from developing at all. Mm -hmm. And that will lead to the outcomes that we had raised in the earlier sections mm -hmm. about decoupling, about it, and I think it will hurt U.S. competitiveness. Mm -hmm. it, it'll, it'll make, it, ironically, it will make us weaker in right. our competition because not everyone's going to go along with us yeah. in that type of approach. Kim, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to say two more quick things about economic nationalism and climate. Um, first of all, the two countries that I think people are most worried about right now in terms of development of coal continuing are China and India. And both of them are making the choice to continue to develop coal, even though we know that coal is one of the worst contributors to climate change, out of concerns of economic nationalism. They don't want to be dependent on anybody else for their energy supplies. And uh, because they have abundant coal deposits themselves, they're therefore going to go for them. Um, and secondly, we really haven't talked about either solar or wind very much. Um, in solar power, China has managed to get a, a huge percentage of the market on all kinds of things that are related to solar cells and solar arrays. And now the United States is finding itself uh, sort of in a, you know, sort of a, a backtracking position because China has started threatening, well, if you're going to cut us off of these semiconductors, why don't we cut you off of the solar technology? Um, and maybe in the long run, that's something that could be useful to the United States to develop its own solar energy. Um, but of course, we don't have the long run to worry about before climate change becomes horrible. And just we'll get those northern trade routes yet. <laughs> okay. 
thing. Um, and, and one more thing to think about is that um, these, these partnerships that Jack has been talking about, people are seriously pursuing them in wind energy. Um, and there's sort of, I think, been a recognition that we missed the boat on solar. Um, and now uh, US and European and other um, friendly states, if you want to look at it that way, um, are coming together to do joint projects on wind development to try to make sure that China doesn't get the lock on wind that China has on solar questions. Let me, let me press this a little, just one more moment before we move on to the next one. Uh, might there be some concern that by moving aggressively to deal with the climate problem, the United States would be advantaging some of our rivals, China in the particular case that you talked about with solar, um, maybe the rare earth min um, minerals that they have that are important for the solar industry? Or to be, you know, more, more, more Bismarckian, advantaging our European friends who have made more progress in this way. So, would would there be a perverse sort of geostrategic argument against aggressively moving on climate, or did the Biden administration climate bill solve this by aggressively moving us forward so that we can be a player? Maybe Jack on that one. I think this in reality, might be fair. I actually think we're producing more energy now than we were uh, fossil mm -hmm. fuel energy, and um, we're no longer a net energy importer. We're a net energy ex a fossil fuel exporter. Um, I think that makes it a very different conversation than it was in 1973 or you know 19, uh, the 1990s even. Um, I think we have a bigger national interest in reducing the amount of coal that's used around the world. The point that you know Japan and China, that China and India are actively developing uh, more and more dependence on coal mm -hmm. is more of a risk to us than that. You know that our edge will be lost yeah. to Europe on on new technology. Um, I am a little worried about about the the rare earth stuff. Uh, I don't think it's a crisis today, mm -hmm. but we're also not seeing the demand for it that we'll be seeing if we get to the point that we're really making progress on climate change. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be like a hockey stick, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's, it, it, it's going to take a lot of work for us to keep our edge. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's shift gears a bit back to uh, the geopolitics and, and China and, and Russia. Uh, I, the question I'd pose is that you know, right now, uh, in, in the discussions about grand strategy, we're facing an immense crisis from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it's an invasion uh, launched by, uh, in the nuclear realm, uh, a power that looks like a, a complete equal right now with immense numbers of warheads. So a huge sense of crisis is being focused on Russia. And the question I'd pose, and this is, I think, Tom has already reflected on this a little bit, but the question is, are we in danger of homogenizing our enemies? That is, uh, treating China like Russia, Russia like China, pulling out the same tropes as a way to deal with a complicated uh, world. And if she doesn't object, I'd turn to Mira first on this one. Don't object at all. Um, you know, I would say something happily that I have not seen in government is the homogenization of these two challenges. And quite to the contrary, I think I've actually seen a very acute focus on the need to distinguish between them, not just in terms of what they mean now, but what they mean in terms of the way we prioritize. I'll sound very much like a member of the current administration when I say that I think the national secu security strategy is actually pretty much right with the way that it lays out the characterization of these two different ty types of challenges. It identifies Russia as an acute, very dangerous, near-term challenge, mm -hmm. but it does not call Russia a near peer. It does not characterize it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it likewise identifies China as the only country that is able to mount any sustained challenge to our shared vision for the international order, both in terms of will and in terms of capability. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll add the caveat that that's not necessarily an assertion that China possesses a single blueprint okay. to be unfurled <laughs> over the international system, but, but it is saying... The blueprint, share it with you. I can read it in Chinese. <laughs> it, it is saying that there is no 
significant near peer competitor that can affect our fundamental interests in fundamental ways apart from China, mm. not to minimize the danger of Russia's nuclear arsenal in the near term or to discount the incredible catastrophe that it could cause. But I think what does pose a challenge is the fact that you can't neatly temporalize those two sets of challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Saying that something is a near-term challenge now, but this is the far greater long-term challenge doesn't get you out of the bind. And the primary place where you find that bind is when it comes to resources. Obviously, when the Biden administration took office, it was not expecting to be providing tens of billions of dollars of security assistance to Ukraine year over year. And like the last two administrations before us, uh, we have committed to the idea that we are refocusing our energy and our efforts on the Indo-Pacific. Um, but when it comes to budgets, you face hard trade-offs between those two sets of challenges, and no one knows this better than Jack. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly in a year where we have seen unprecedented levels of security assistance, we have to think about how in the Indo-Pacific you continue to do more, you continue to show that your presence is going to be enduring and that your commitment is going to be long-term with a budget that maybe only ticks up incrementally as opposed to is transformed, um, which is what you might expect to see um, based on the level of commitment we genuinely have hmm. to that region. Now, the, the good news story um, when it comes to kind of how you try to loosen that bind, if not totally mitigate it, is the fact that over the same period of time, we have genuinely seen several allies step up beyond what anyone reasonably would have expected prior to a few years ago, mm. whether that's the uh, aforementioned transformation in Japanese defense and national security spending that I mentioned, or the will to do something similar uh, in Germany, although that will take much, much longer to, I think, bear the same set of fruit. Mm. Um, but even with allies saying that they're willing to bring much more to the table um, when it comes to managing these two challenges, it still remains the case that policymakers have to make very, very hard choices between putting Ukraine in its best possible position to prevail today while preparing the Indo-Pacific for what very likely will be a set of more pronounced challenges tomorrow. Good. Thank you very much. Any additional, Tom, I could, you, you don't need to jump in on this one is what I'm seeing. No, I'm, I'm good. Good. Excellent. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move to uh, one more uh, issue that I think we'll have time to cover, and then we'll open up for questions and, and comments from uh, our wonderful audience. Uh, this is back to socioeconomics and the issue of demography. Uh, we've seen uh, a decline in the uh, Russian population since 1991, from 147 million to 145 million. That's unusual that countries decline in population, and we know some of the stories behind it in Russia, and some of them, of course, quite tragic. At the same time, we've seen other uh, demographic de uh, determinations that are significant. Um, the population of China is aging and will even more rapidly age, were we here, because of the distribution of young people who will soon become old people. Um, and that will uh, be unstoppable, barring uh, uh, a horrible uh, pandemic or a war. And we don't need just to focus on our two rivals. Uh, there are European countries whose populations are rapidly aging as well. Uh, here in the US, less acute because of, of immigration, but nonetheless happening. And so all of these socio-demographics are at work. Uh, they're, hard, they're hard to change. Um, so what should we think about the implications of this for geopolitics? Will older, wiser people suddenly calm down the world? <laughs> or will a sense of crisis and vulnerability increase tensions in some form or another? And I haven't mentioned the very rapid growth of the population of Africa, which will soon be extremely uh, uh, noticeable on the global stage, and they will be much younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question is, what is demographics going to do? Is it going to be pacifying? Is it going to be exacerbating? Or we just don't know. So I'm looking for some volunteers. And I think I've got uh, Kim up 
first. Okay. okay. I mean, I can say something about Russia, which is that it, it has been striking to me that Putin has not cared about population outflows and population decreases that have been caused by his war in Ukraine. We talked earlier in the session about the number of casualties that have occurred in Russia, which is just stunning that he was willing to have all those people be killed and seriously injured and therefore affected for the rest of their lives. And guess what? Most of them are young. Um, uh, uh, talking about all the people that were driven out of Russia, huge outflow of people. Um, some of the best estimates are around 200,000 people have left Russia um, uh, in two waves, basically. Uh, once when uh, it was clear that the war was going to happen, and then when Putin announced his mobilization drive. Um, and because of the level of corruption in Russia, and because the people who are leaving tend to be people who are very highly skilled and younger, I would predict that they're going to find a much more congenial environment where they're going, and they're not going to be all that eager to come home again, even if the war is over, um, because they will be making more money and hanging on to more of their money um, in the places where they're now located instead of Russia, because of Russia's very high corruption and graft level. Um, and so I think in the long run, and we, we've seen this in terms of Putin's reaction to sanctions, which I think the, the general assessment is it has cost Russian industrial innovation in things that really matter to Russia, like the energy sector, um, very strongly going forward um, in, in, in a generational kind of, of term, um, that Putin just doesn't care about the long-term effects on Russia of his decisions. Mm. Um, and I think it's going to have a long-term effect on, on Russian viability because the young people are not going to come back anytime soon, and some of them are dying. Hmm. So what we should expect is what we see from Russia, at least no direct effect, even though it should, because in the long run, it'll have a severe cost for Russia. Well, and, and the older people are going to start dying off, and it's not clear who is going to replace them. I mean, there's been some indication of the children of people who are um, in positions of power in the Kremlin also having, you know, oligarchic positions given to them in industry and so forth. Um, but I, I, we have not seen that kind of wave of who the replacement is going to be when the Putin generation, who are now, you know, well into their 60s. 70s, uh, that, that age group, when they start dying off, who's going to replace them? Yeah. What about China? So for China, I, I think the issue is really about the uh, long-term economic impact of aging. Um, and it's probably going to be pretty severe. Most economists who study China uh, think it's going to be a, a severe constraint on, on future economic growth. It's not going to stop economic growth. It's going to slow it down. Um, and that's because of the one-child chi policy that, that they had for a very, very long time. Uh, the one-child policy produced uh, lots of uh, families with one kid because uh, it was successful. And um, health care and general economic well-being in China has improved, which has had two um, impacts. The general economic well-being has improved, and there's been urbanization, and wealthier uh, urban couples tend to have fewer kids, mm -hmm. even if they're allowed to, and now they are. So they're not... Uh, rushing to, to have more children now that they're allowed to. Um, and the second thing is it means that older people survive for a lot longer. Um, uh, the, the healthcare system in China is, is, is solid and getting better. Uh, it has a lot of challenges, but it's solid and getting better. And um, uh, so people are going to live longer and they're going to be uh, a burden on their relatively uh, smaller demographic, uh, younger generation, which means from a national security perspective that China will have less uh, disposable uh, income for discretionary spending on things like the military, uh, mm -hmm. so that that would have an impact. Another impact that used to be talked about, I, I served back in the uh, George W. Bush administration, and people used to talk about this as a kind of uh, argument for being confident that China would not become belligerent, not within the administration, I'm just saying at that time, people in society made these arguments. Um, and that was that the one child policy meant that China would never become belligerent because families only had one kid and they would never approve of belligerence from Beijing because the one child would be at risk. And um, I just always took it personally. You know I mean? <laughs> and the reason is I'm the youngest of seven in a big Catholic family. <laughs> And, and I kind of like to think that my parents were going to say, well, we got six others. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, just to, that's a personal note. But uh, yeah, so I, I think it's more about the, the economic constraints than it is okay. about yeah. whether they'll yeah. go to war. Thank you. Jack. The good news is we're all, in, amongst the great powers we're talking about, are all facing demographic mm -hmm. challenges. So it's not as if it's lopsided one way or the other. You know, we're aging, China is aging, Europe is aging, mm -hmm. Japan is aging. Mm -hmm. 
The emerging countries are growing, um, and I think there's going to be some reshifting of position in the world because that has implications for growth. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree with Tom on the kind of budgetary pressure question in terms of China. China doesn't have social insurance programs. So they're trying to, but they haven't precisely because of this concern. They're worried that it will be too big of a tax on the country going forward. I think there's more pressure in the United States in terms of fiscal pressures with an aging population because we're not going to cut Social Security. We're not going to cut Medicare. And when you hear the debate over what do we do about our fiscal challenges, people say we're going to protect defense, but you don't make any progress if all you do is cut non-defense. And I think you're going to see more pressure on our defense budgets as the kind of demographic pressures put more stress on our fiscal posture. Now, I don't think that's good. I'm not advocating that. But I, when I talk to Republicans who ask me about how they should deal with some of these, mm. these budget challenges we face, I said, mm -hmm. be careful before you talk about limiting uh, you know, overall spending, mm -hmm. because the, the big hit could easily be on defense at some point. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what you want. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I don't have a good answer to that, mm -hmm. short of raising taxes and doing some sensible things. Right. But we're not in a political environment where those are likely to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And as the you know, Congressional Budget Office projections that came out this week show, it's no surprise the baby boom is getting older. You know, it's like much as <laughs> so many of us would like to deny that. Right. It is just <laughs> a fact. <laughs> Okay, uh, very interesting. I think you know the, the message is very little evidence of immediate direct impact of democracy, demography, but a long-term impact that our countries will or won't be able to handle well, which will have eventual geopolitical uh, consequences. Uh, we have other questions, but we also have a wonderful audience. So with the permission of the panel, I'm gonna stop the questions and uh, open it up to any questions or comments. Please identify yourself and, and uh, wait for uh, a microphone. I think I see Paige back there. Hi, Paige Fortna from here at Columbia. I've got a question that links the last two questions that you asked, Michael. Mm. Um, so if we think about the effects of climate change on great power, rivalry, balance of power, that sort of thing, and we think about the demographic effects, mm. climate change is going to affect demography mostly through migration. Mm. Um, and my, just off the top of my head, I would think that the countries we're talking about are differently open to migration. So if mm. anybody would like to talk about how those two things might mm. interplay going forward. Thanks. Great question. Uh, why don't we, I think a quick, a quick response on that issue about openness and uh, migration. I would say as an economic matter, mm -hmm. um, it is profoundly against our economic interest to be as closed on immigration mm -hmm. as we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 25 years, I've wondered why the American business community isn't more effective making the case mm -hmm. on strictly economic grounds that we, that's how we grew for 250 years and it's going to be how we grow or don't grow. Yeah. Um, you know, other countries have, in Japan, they have not opened up. Uh, they've kind of adapted with longer uh, work lives. Um, you know, that isn't something that's going so well as Macron tries that in yep. France. Yep. You know? <laughs> so immigration actually is a huge economic issue. If I would jump in on that same thing, I, I've been living in Berlin for a few months and uh, the Minister of Immigration uh, said that there are 900,000 unfilled jobs in Germany. And Germany's been very good at pushing uh, employment. But yet a great deal of political nervousness about immigration. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that they've welcomed a million Ukrainians, they've got hundreds of thousands of Afghans who've come in. Mm -hmm. By the measures of other countries, they get gold stars yeah. for... Uh, humanitarianism, but a great deal of nervousness. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is going to produce some tensions uh, down the road. Yeah. And Jack, men Jack mentioned uh, Japan. It's a national identity issue. They don't want to have pe people come in. A lot of people, talented people around Asia, would love to move to Tokyo and take you know, desirable jobs. Uh, but it seems to be across the political spectrum in Japan. Mm -hmm. But it's also true in China. Um, a lot of people would move. To, you can't move. To, you can't become a Chinese citizen. Mm 
if you're outside of China. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't matter how good your Chinese is. It doesn't matter how long you live there. And it has to do with a, a real national identity problem that they have there. They, they don't know what the Chinese nation really is. So they've kind of come up with the least common denominator. It, it is the people who were born in the borders that are on our map. Right? Because they don't want to say Han Chinese, even though mm -hmm. there is Han Chinese nationalism and chauvinism on the rise in China. They don't want to say that because they're, they're a multi-ethnic country. Mm -hmm. They can't talk about rule of law or constitution. Mm -hmm. You can't swear loyalty to the constitution. Mm -hmm. So they just settle with that. And that means it closes off a real option for them. Because um, you know, if, if it's not taxation, then it's going to be a tremendous burden. It's hard to be a Chinese citizen in terms of your family obligations. It'd be a real burden on the younger generation of workers when they have to, when the, the state doesn't move in to help their elderly relatives, they have That's to why do the it. savings rate is yeah. so high. Yeah, <laughs> the savings rate is so high because the government doesn't have the social, they're trying to create it. But um, so that's a real challenge for, for China. And mm -hmm. to, to address it, they would have to call, open up a big can of worms, which is what does China mean? What does it mean to be Chinese? OK. Uh, I think Jean-Marie had his hand up, and then our colleague right uh, to his left. Yeah, thank you. My question is on great power competition in the rest of the world. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that a big chunk of the world, including significant powers like India, don't want to be drawn into the uh, present geopolitical divide. Uh, and um, is that indifferent? Is it a real problem? Is it an indictment of our narrative of democracies against autocracies? Uh, with a narrative that the rest of the world doesn't really identify with? I mean, what's the views of the panel? So, so Mira is the expert. You know, Mira does this. She's the drawer <laughs> of India. This is her job. You're this is her job. Genre. And she's doing it fantastically, but it's not easy. But over to Mira. <laughs> uh, so, it is a very reasonable question, uh, and it's one that we think about a lot. Um, and it goes without saying, I think, um, that the frame about how much you emphasize regime type and democracies versus autocracies is differently resonant in different parts of the world. It is super meaningful in Europe, um, and it's not the way that many of our partners in the Indo-Pacific see things. Right? Um, you've got all sorts of complicated regime types in the Indo-Pacific that don't fall neatly on one side or the other, and reminding Singapore that they're not technically a democracy is never going to go over well. <laughs> I think the way that we have approached thinking about this conundrum, um, which we do agree is, is very much a conundrum, is to focus on positive agendas and shared objectives as opposed to making great power competition the primary storyline when you're working with allies. Um, so as an example, the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy has three paragraphs on China, which do not pull their punches in their characterization of the challenge that the PRC poses. But the vast majority of the document, the remaining document, makes no mention of the PRC and is rather focused on a set of strategic objectives that we seek to advance in Asia working alongside like-minded allies and partners, all of which necessarily are informed by or have some implication for the competition with China, but there's no need to say it that way. So I think when it comes to a lot of engagement, whether it's with India um, or with many powers in Southeast Asia, it's not a secret that the United States it sees itself as being in a competition with China. But when it comes to either the high-level statement of national strategy or the way we frame our talking points when we're inside rooms diplomatically, focusing on those positive objectives and what we seek to achieve together rather than who or what we intend to prevent uh, seems to be working fairly well thus far. I just wanted to say that, you know, um, I run into Mira in Washington sometimes when I go down to do advising, and she would never say this, but I'll say it, that that strategy that she just laid out, there's a certain person who used to study with Bob Jervis that um, is, uh, is responsible for that approach, and I think it's the right approach. <laughs> if, I could, if, if I could jump in on that same question on democracies and autocracies. If, if democracies, you know, do their job properly, they should, this is ideal theory, be reflecting the, the basic interest of their citizens. And for many developing countries, uh, the basic interest of their citizens are putting food on the table, shelter to live in, medicine to live by. 
And therefore, even though this horrible autocracy in Moscow has invaded a charming democratically elected President Zelensky, that's, that is and probably should be very far from the priorities that they face. And for the autocracies in the developing world, and here I speak from a, a, a personal friend experience, one of my favorite uh, former students is Vietnam's ambassador to Berlin. And so I saw a lot of them over the past uh, few months. And we had a lot of conversations about the Ukraine war, of course, and, and others. And, and, and what he explains to me is that, you know, as a young man growing up, the survival of Vietnam heavily depended upon one major ally, it was the USSR, uh, was uh, backing them up. So they would not have survived, they think, as an independent country if the USSR had not been there. And therefore, Russia, you know, gains the, the credit that comes from all of that. And nor do they want to live in a world uh, of a, of a one dominant ideology or institutional form, diversity is their source of autonomy. That is that the, they can look to Beijing, look to Moscow, look to elsewhere. And so all of those dy dynamics come into play. And that even though democracy and autocracy makes a great deal of sense for the, across the North Atlantic and in a lot of other ways, it doesn't resonate with the deepest sources of policy, I think, driving many countries in the developing world. And for very good reasons, not just because they, they, they're not solidaristic with the lovely principles. And so I think it's, a, it's something that's likely to continue. Michael, yeah. just to underscore how important this work is, if you look at the voting in the UN and, and expressions of support or neutrality, we're doing really well keeping the big economies of the world with us doing everything they need to do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the population of the world, the mm -hmm. countries that are either allied with Russia or neutral, yeah. it's a little worrisome that more people in the world are in those countries. Yeah. And in the long term, that, 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 we've got to win them back. Yeah. I mean, if we think that, you know, there's, there's Brazil that's very skeptical, South Africa, India, Indonesia. These are all highly yeah. populous countries that are not completely signed up. Yeah, yeah, Kim. Can I just give a shout out to the work of Alex Cooley on the idea that third parties um, really sort of like being in this position because they can play various great powers off of each other. Um, and so we have to remember that they have agency too. Yeah, uh, Our friend Erdogan is doing that in his <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, and our, our colleague over here uh, was, was, has patiently or impatiently waited, I'm not sure, but your Thank floor you very is yours. much. Um, my name is Suzanne Sternthal, and I also was a, a, a student of Robert Jervis's. And my question is directed to Tom. If I understood you correctly, you were saying that you have not found any evidence to the effect that um, Putin and China are in cahoots in terms of undoing the liberal world order, if I understood correctly. No, Is that, that correct? I didn't, that's not what I said, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I thought I, somehow I <laughs> yeah. understood that okay. you said something that you didn't find much evidence to support that. But OK, since I'm talking, I'm going to. No, no, just the ask the question and I'll respond to it. But that, 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 pre, that preface isn't right. But I'll, Oh, I'm sorry question. about that. But that's OK. Say what um, you're saying. Well, it's, it's not so much a question as um, you know, uh, a point, uh, and that is that in uh, 1997, under uh, Yeltsin and Deng Xiaoping, they concluded a very, very long uh, agreement with respect to somehow undoing the world order. They called it already a, a multipolar order and so on. And uh, Putin, last February, early February, uh, concluded similar uh, agreement um, with um, with whom? <laughs> yeah, Xi Jinping, yeah. Jinping okay. right? Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So so yeah. So thank you. Um, so it's definitely the case that both Russia and China want to create what they call a multipolar world, which is actually not a multipolar world. So if you ask a you ask a, a Chinese diplomat.
by multipolar world, do you mean like it's okay if Japan gets a nuclear uh, second strike capability and becomes a real pole? No, no, that's not what we meant. What we meant is we don't want the United States to bully us. So what they mean by the multipolarity is they don't want the United States to bully them. Uh, that's not what the international order, as I see it, is um, what they're portraying. The United States is bullying us, so we need a multipolar order. So what they're saying is they want to have more voice in the world. That's very different than uh, changing the rules of the international system. Um, so it was Jiang Zemin in 1997, because Deng had passed. Um, but it would be Jiang Zemin and, and the Russian leadership then. They might have come up with something about multi multipolarity. They still say things about multipolarity. But the key thing I want to say is Russia is a real revisionist. Russia wants to change the rules of international relations. Mm -hmm. Russia, doesn't, Russia wants to overthrow democracies mm -hmm. and replace them with autocracies. Right? Russia is the classical revisionist power. China is not like that right now. It could become that way. And one of the things that concerns me about China and the Russian invasion of Ukraine is I think Putin snookered Xi Jinping mm -hmm. by having that big public statement, we're close, we're best friends, and then invading uh, Ukraine, which does not run with China's interests, mm -hmm. and drag China into a much more revisionist position diplomatically, internationally, mm -hmm. because they don't want to separate from Russia, because Russia does two things for China. It, helps China stand up to the United States effort to spread democracy, color revolution, so they, they share that aversion. And it also provides some real politic power to China to have a close friend like Russia. But China is not for the invasion and overthrow of the sovereign government of Ukraine, with which they had very good relations, but they can't, now he can't separate from him entirely. So it's created a huge set of dilemmas for China. So what I had said was that I don't think China has a blueprint for a new international order with a whole new set of trade, uh, international di diplomatic rules, et cetera. And it is often described, even in US executive branch documents, as having such a goal and having such a plan. And it may develop that. We should be watching it. But I watch China, and I don't see the plan. And it's hard to create a plan. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't begrudge them. You know, it's really hard to create a new blueprint for international politics writ large. How would they, how would they get a consensus within their system about what it would look like, right? So they resist. They resist being uh, pushed around by the United States. But in various things like uh, international trade, they're much more multilateral now than we are. They're joining all these multilateral, new multilateral agreements. They're even, strangely, applying to join the TPP, which we pulled out of, right? Which we helped negotiate and then we pulled out of. Um, so I don't see them as revisionist in that way. Now, I'll just finish with where I started. I worry about the rise of China more than most people in this room. It's kind of my job to worry about the rise of China. So I'm very concerned about various strategic and economic and other aspects of China's rise. But I don't worry about that thing. And that thing is what everybody in Washington agrees on is happening. And it has negative implications because there are various things that are China, China is doing in the developing world. We just mentioned the developing world. Mm -hmm. That the developing world is asking China to do, asking for the loans, asking for the development. And because we have this framework, this misperception in Washington, we send diplomats to those places to scold them for taking Chinese money. Be careful. They're using you. They have, a, they have a global plan to upset the world. Everything they do is part of that plan. And these people say, you're, you're calling us, you're saying they're predators? You're calling us prey. In, in post-colonial nationalist countries, it's not appreciated when Americans come and say, you're a bunch of dopes and you're being duped and you're prey. And it's not always true that the economic relations with China are bad for the country. And we have to accept that. And what we should do is what Jack said. Instead of whining about what China is doing in those places, we should be doing stuff. And we should provide something better rather than complaining about what China is doing. And that would be a better strategic competitive approach than we have now. But a lot of it is colored by this idea that everything China is doing is bad because China has this alternative plan for international relations that will benefit China instead of us. And I don't see it. <laughs>
uh, Kim, and then we'll be wrapping up because it's time for us to do so. Just Please. very briefly, Putin needs Xi much more than Xi needs Putin. Um, Xi and China are much more integrated into the international economic community than Putin is. Um, one of the reasons that conflict between the United States and Russia has accelerated to the extent it has is that there really isn't much of an economic relationship between U.S. and Russia, and so there's, there's nothing stopping it from happening. Um, and um, I would just urge us all to, uh, along with Tom, pay attention not to what China says, but to what China does. Let me add just one small thing, because I've, I've agreed with everything the panel has said this afternoon, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Except, uh -oh. except for the last minute of Tom's remarks. Okay, so, 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 <laughs> I, so, I, so we'll close out the panel with me being wrong. <laughs> no. It's all right. No, I'll just provide an alternative, slight <laughs> alternative perspective. I agree with everything you said about China. All you got to do is read G's speech to Davos last year. It was an eloquent defense of the global multilateral order. Uh, but the one thing that China does is that it undermines a very carefully invested effort to create a regime that nudges countries towards human rights slowly, towards the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Goals, towards a bit of openness, towards a bit of, uh, even a bit of democracy. It's built into the international institutions in the World Bank and elsewhere. And what China does in many cases is that it insulates some pretty nasty dictators mm -hmm. from any of that pressure. Definitely. So they're, they're not trying to reshape the international order. They're defending the Westphalian right. order exactly. of none of the pressure exactly. that has been put forward to nudge countries in a more humane so, direction. So that's how I put it in, in the, this, the, the book I wrote in 2016, which is that China is a conservative actor in international order politics. It likes the old order and it defends it. And the United States is the revisionist. I like the revisionism of the United States. I like the spread of democracy. I like the spread of human rights. But we have to recognize that things like uh, the Millennium Challenge uh, approach to development mm -hmm. or the responsibility to protect. Those are innovations. Mm -hmm. They're revisions. They're good revisions. I like them, mm -hmm. right? China resists those. So we end up in friction over these things, right. but it doesn't mean China is the revisionist. Yep. Okay, with that, we all agree, I think. So please thank my <laughs> panelists. I think they did a wonderful job. <laughs>